I'm going to uh, finish up the atmospheric portion of this class with lecture number seven, severe weather. And I want to uh, talk about two other kinds of cyclones. Uh, obviously, I want to begin with tornadoes and give you just some basic information about tornadoes. Uh, wind speeds are strong, maybe starting at about 100 miles per hour and certainly exceeding 300 miles per hour. And one thing that I want to point out is that tornadoes represent the fastest wind speeds known to humans at the Earth's surface. Uh, they certainly exceed uh, the wind speeds of, of hurricanes. I mean, hurricanes max out at about 180, maybe 200, and that's pretty much where strong tornadoes just get started. And their size, quite small, all right? You know, we're talking about uh, an average size of about 500 feet, the size of a city block or two. Now, they can be small whirls, you know, tiny things, or they can be, you know, large, uh, maybe like a half a mile in diameter. Uh, but most commonly, we're talking about, you know, several hundred feet. Here we are uh, showing the distribution uh, of tornadic activity uh, in the world, and something really stands out, and that's North America, particularly the United States. The United States ranks number one in the world for tornadic activity. We, on average, receive about 1,300 per year. And then second ranking Canada uh, receives only about 100 per year. And then third ranking Australia receives about 10 to 15 per year. So there's something going on in the United States that is the has the perfect uh, environment for the creation uh, of this severe weather system. All right, let's take a look at the United States. All right, now in, in the U.S., uh, the focus is uh, the central plains, all right, particularly the interior lowlands and the Gulf and Atlantic coastal plain. Uh, they're not so frequent in the mountainous west or in the, in the northeast or the Appalachian where we've got mountains there. The bullseye is a place called Tornado Alley, you know, centered on Oklahoma, but that has the greatest frequency of any place else on Earth. Now, uh, what is important about this uh, central plain is that it's a vast lowland that's open to opposite air masses, right? And so we've got, you know, continental polar or continental Arctic air coming on down from Canada. Then at the same time, we've got maritime tropical air coming up from the Gulf of Mexico, and they meet in this vast lowland. So, the cloud of violent weather, cumulonimbus clouds. And so uh, uh, tornadoes are spawned in a uh, cumulonimbus cloud. And what you need uh, is very unstable air with violent, warm updrafts, you know, moving at 100 or 200 miles per hour. Then the other thing that you need are strong upper level winds, all right? And it's called wind shear. So you've got, you know, horizontal winds right moving at the same time as you've got the violent vertical updrafts and so this wind shear gets those violent updrafts to rotate right to rotate and then eventually emerge from the base of the cumulonimbus cloud as a tornado there's a beautiful and there too all right in the united states i've got 50 years of data showing you uh tornadic frequency on a monthly basis. Now, as you can see, they occur, you know, in every month of the year, uh, but there's definitely a, a peak during the spring months. And the peak is definitely due to cold fronts. Now, I've kind of already alluded to that when I was talking about the interior lowlands, you know, uh, being uh, a place with a meeting of opposite air masses. Uh, so in terms of fronts, the you know, cold fronts have the squall line of cumulonimbus clouds, and so you can have some violent updrafts in that squall line. Then at the same time, behind that cold front, you can have some vertical wind shear, you know, uh, moving that front along that can spawn uh, tornadoes. And so, indeed. Uh, and the other thing about the spring peak is that is when uh, we've got the greatest contrast of air masses in the United States. You, you can still get some pretty cold air coming down from Canada. And we know the spring months in maritime tropical air really starts to, you know, heat up uh, and become quite unstable. And so when you've got a big difference in air masses, uh, you can really create some violent updrafts. All right, uh, now 
we do also do get uh, tornadoes uh, <clears throat> during the summer months. And, you know, we get them here in the, in the south. Uh, and they're spawned by, you know, a really unstable air uh, and convectional thunderstorms. And then you can get uh, some tornadoes during the fall months. And, of course, they're going to be spawned uh, in cumulonimbus clouds and all those rain bands. Yeah. So we're going to move on to the second uh, cyclone of uh, violent weather, and that's uh, hurricanes. And again, I'm just going to give you some basic information. Now, the, the true name of a hurricane is a tropical cyclone, right? It's a, it's a center of low pressure of tropical origin. And uh, to become a hurricane, uh, wind speeds have to reach 74 miles per hour and then max out at about 180. All right, the seasonality. Uh, we're going to just focus on those that affect the United States, you know, the, the tropical North Atlantic Caribbean hurricanes. And we know this, you know, we live in you know, Hurricane Alley in the Gulf of Mexico, and we know the peak is fall, right? Uh, September in particular. And uh, so uh, we know it takes a long time for oceans to warm up. And so there is kind of a lag effect. And the ocean finally reaches its maximum sea surface temperature, you know, delayed from summer, you know, kind of moving a little bit into fall. Uh, and so you need temperatures uh, of, of the sea surface to exceed about 80, 81 degrees in order to get enough unstable air to create a hurricane. The size, the scale. Uh, so uh, hurricanes are kind of in the middle, you know, whereas wave cyclones are a couple thousand miles in diameter and uh, tornadoes are a couple hundred feet in diameter. Hurricanes are kind of in the middle. Uh, and, you know, normal size is about 300 miles. Here's Hurricane Andrew, about 200 miles in diameter. And here you've got the peninsula of Florida to give you some sort of scale. All right, they're called tropical cyclones. And so I'm going to show you uh, a world map showing you, you know, where they occur. And indeed, I mean, uh, here's the Tropic of Capricorn, the Tropic of Cancer. And so they, indeed, they form in the tropics. All right, they definitely form in the tropics. But there's a, a couple of noteworthy places in the tropics uh, where they never form. Uh, the equator, for sure. They never form at the equator or, or within a few degrees, maybe five degrees north and south. And that's uh, pretty incredible. We know what's going on at the equator. All right, we've got the equatorial low pressure belt, we've got the intertropical convergence, and we've got plenty of convectional precipitation and plenty of cumulonimbus clouds. But the problem is there is no Coriolis effect, there is no turning effect to get all of those clouds to turn or to rotate. And it, here's the, the di a diagram of the Coriolis effect again. And it's actually absent at the equator. There's no deflection. And uh, as is indicated here, the, the amount of deflection or turning effect of, of the Coriolis uh, gets greater and greater and greater and it maxes out actually at the poles. And that's because the Earth is a sphere and the spinning effect is, you know, greater as the Earth is curving away. At the bulge, the turning effect is nil. And so that's, that's pretty incredible. And of course, you know, you, you never get a, a hurricane forming in the northern hemisphere and crossing the equator, you know, and then it would have to reverse direction in the southern hemisphere. That, that just doesn't happen. All right, and now within the tropics, it's also noteworthy that they never form, all right, uh, in the southern Pacific Ocean, particularly on the east side, the eastern southern Pacific. Look at that. Now, they occur in, uh, you know, the northern, tropical northern Pacific. They occur in the tropical, you know, um, North Atlantic. But here, again, they never occur in the, in the tropical South Atlantic. So I've got two questions here. You know, why don't they form there when they're for, uh, forming in every other tropical ocean? And it comes down to sea surface temperatures. Uh, it's believed that uh, the cold ocean currents that are occurring on the west sides of South America and on the west side of Africa, that's not shown here, are receiving super cold water from Antarctica. And it's keeping... Uh, those cold ocean currents, all right, and bringing that cold Antarctic water to the tropics and keeping 
the sea surface temperatures just below that threshold of 80 or 81 degrees. So it is really quite noteworthy that they don't occur in those tropical oceans. All right, they're tracks. All right, classic track. All right, so these are uh, winds uh, of the of the tropics, and so we, uh, yeah. They form in the tropics, and the winds of the tropics are the trade winds. So, indeed, the main steering current to begin with uh, is the trade winds. So, they're going to travel from east to west in the trade winds, and then there's a tendency uh, for them to recurve to the northeast in the westerly winds. And so, that's kind of a, a typical U shaped track. And here's Hurricane Andrews track, all right? And so it's like that classic U-shaped track. And that U-shaped shaped track, uh, you know, is part, is, is guided actually by the Bermuda High that, that intensifies during the summer months over the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, and so you've got the trade winds and then the steering, right, and the recurving into the westerlies. And also the, the size of the Bermuda High is also going to determine whether the hurricane is going to track to the Gulf of Mexico or whether it's going to track to the Atlantic. Now, if the, the Bermuda High uh, really enlarges over uh, you know, the eastern United States, uh, that's going to track, that's going to help to track these hurricanes to the Gulf. Now, if the Bermuda High is kind of small and remains offshore, it'll track those uh, hurricanes to the Atlantic. All right. So, uh, definitely a major uh, rain producer. And we know that there are three ways to produce precipitation. You know, you've got convection, uh, you've got orographic, or you've got fronts. It's definitely... Uh, convectional precipitation and here we've got a cross-section of a hurricane and so it's made up of a rapidly rotating cumulonimbus clouds and so CB is the symbol in meteorology for cumulonimbus and here we've got a whole bunch of cumulonimbus clouds and giant anvils and spreading out at the top of the troposphere and an interesting thing about uh, hurricanes is the cloud-free eye Right. And so, uh, when a cloud, re when a, a hurricane really starts to intensify, uh, it, that means it's uh, rotating really rapidly. And uh, when you wind up with rapid rotation, uh, remember the centrifugal force. I think I mentioned it, you know, the, the first uh, slide in in this class. The, the states that any rotating body, the mass pulls away from the center. And it's kind of like here, a, a whirlpool of effect in water, which is a fluid. And so you wind up with, you know, rotating water. And that rotation uh, in the centrifugal force is going to pull the water apart. And you're going to wind up with descending water, descending water in the center as the water is pulling apart, you know, creating an opening. In the middle and the same thing that is going on with air which is a fluid and uh, what winds up happening is the rapidly rotating uh, storm system uh, is going to pull away from the center and you're going to wind up creating uh, a descend an area of descending air and you know as the fluid is pulling away and creating a cloud free eye and so you're going to wind up with a mini high pressure system and descending air. And if you've got descending air, you're not going to create, uh, you know, any clouds of precipitation. One uh, final thing is the side, uh, the side of the storm. All right, uh, the right side, uh, I think we know, is the bad side. That's the side that you really don't want to be on. And so usually the right side of the storm is the strongest side. Uh, you know, you're going to have the greatest storm surge, the greatest wind speeds, the greatest rain, tornadoes, and things like that. And it all has to do with the fact that uh, the storm is generally moving in a northward direction. And at the same time, due to the counterclockwise circulation, the right side of the storm, the winds are moving also northerly in general. And so you've got two things working hand in hand uh, that helps to enhance the strength of the storm on the right side. 
And so you can see the, the greatest rain bands are here. Uh, the storm surge, obviously, you know, you're, you're pushing the surface of the ocean onshore. And so uh, you're going to have the onshore flow on the right side rather than the left side. You're actually pulling the ocean away. And the winds are going to be strongest, too. You, you can tell strong winds if the isobars are really close together, creating you know, a stronger pressure gradient. And indeed, you can kind of see that they are a bit closer together than here on the left side. That ends this lecture.